try to convey through these 10, 11 verses. I've heard a lot of preaching on this text and uh, the focus of the preaching has been abundance. Abundance. God wants to fill an empty neck. Wow, you know, I want a, I got a Mitsubishi Panzer now and I like uh, milk. Uh, incidentally, a couple of months ago, I ran into one. <laughs> and it happened to be somebody who owns it in the church. And God's bless came upon that person and they forgave me. Somebody thought I hit it intentionally. But you know, you have what you call a senior's moment. You know, how, you know, how, how is it okay if I tell much for it? Okay. How many of you knew your much for it? Okay. Right. Uh, on Thursday, I went to pick up something in Moravian and I, it was 42 in this temperature. Uh, I won't go into the details of what I had to pick up. And I went into a cafe and uh, had a coffee to eat up, eat up a little more. And, and there was a newspaper. So I read the newspaper and I got into my car and I am driving and I can see the newspaper on my seat. And I'm asking myself, how did it get there? You have what is called a senior moment. That's the reality. That type of senior moment is okay as long as you don't get up in the morning and your wife's name is Jennifer, you don't call her Ethel. <laughs> because then you are not explaining to her. So, there are some indications, however much you try to not deal with the reality. Last night I went to a pharmacy and there was an elderly gentleman there with his daughter. And you know, he was very rude. You know why he was rude? He looked at his daughter and he said, Darling, give that old man a seat. I felt very hurt. <laughs> because I never saw myself that way. So maybe I'm going to hackle. But that's really it. I look at myself in the mirror and I, I don't know old, but there's a reality. And God was doing a reality check on me for 10 years ago, there would be another story. Jesus is on the lake of Genazareth, verse 1 to 3, with the crown pressing on him to hear the word of God. And he was standing by the lake and he saw two boats, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Because they had fished all night, but caught nothing. And so you wash the net to take off the particles that are engaged in that net because when the particles are there, you can't be successful. But getting into one of the boats, which was Simon, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when they had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. You know, Simon is not the type of guy you would want on your team. We all wish we had the greatest leaders on a team. And when people complain to me of a lack in that area, I look at them and say, look what I have. Jesus worked with people that a lot of us might find difficult to manage. Because he saw something inside you that he can draw out. Ministry in kingdom life is not for a select few. Every one of us is given an opportunity, but we have to decide how faithfully we are going to steward that opportunity. You don't need to be the smartest guy in town to serve God. If you are, 
That's great. But if you aren't, there's still hope for you. I, my mind goes back to one guy whom God brought me into contact with, who believed in me to others around in my church didn't. He saw something in my life that God had showed him and he knew how to draw it out. And I am here today, apart from the grace of God, by the contribution he made to my life. Because he saw beyond me. He was forward looking. Somebody told me yesterday, last evening, your son was forward looking. Because when he was 15 years old and we were down at the Harrisville Primary School, he was a Sunday school teacher. And one morning we were looking for the kids. And they were not in the church, in the Harrisville Primary School Hall. He had put them all into a trolley and took them to Joel's Food Park next door. That's forward looking. He saw potential. His way of doing church was different to mine. And they still remember that. They don't remember my way of preaching. Do you have enough vision to see as Jesus sees and act in accordance with? He intentionally got into Simon's boat. He knew Simon would fail. Failure is part of life's processing. You don't have to stay there. It's a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. And if there is one thing the enemy will do, is to keep you in failure mode, because then you can never move forward. But the men in the Bible that God used greatly were failures from a human person, not from God's. And my responsibility in stewarding this house that God has placed in my hands is to look at people not just with problems but with potential and work with them to take them past the problem to fulfill their destiny and purpose. The bigger the vision, the more carriers needed to support it. You see, because when the nets broke, verse 9 and 10, they had to call their partners to join them. You can't accomplish anything significant by yourself. Isolation is a dangerous place to be. Now you know, some people focus on success. I focus on significance. There's a difference between the two. <coughs> Having five homes that are all mortgaged is not success from a biblical perspective. You don't own the home anyway, the magnus. But some people get their self worth by that stuff. And Simon had to learn that Jesus is not just interested in an, filling an empty net. He wants to take you beyond that. Because in verse 10 he said to him, Do not be afraid, for now you will be catching men. Jesus believed in Peter even when he didn't believe in, in, in himself. You know, I, I just want to encourage some of you this morning. That you don't think too much of yourself. Maybe you're struggling with self-esteem issues. 
and you put on a brave face because you want to look good, you don't have to. Because God can see past the facade. He wants authenticity. It's only when we are authentic that we can come to a realization we are all broken. But for the grace of God. You know, as I meditated on this text, I began to see one area of neglect in kingdom life. We can focus so much on teaching and we can give little attention to reaching. Teaching churches don't grow. They don't. Reaching churches do. He taught, but he set the limits. And he finished his teaching and he said, Simon, go out into the deep and let down your net. Faith must result in action. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to actually do it. That's the hard part. That's the challenging part. And others focus on the miracle. But the miracle is always a sign of something deeper that God wants to accomplish in and through you. You know, we have churches in, 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 in many parts of the world that focus on the miraculous. And, and that's good, not, not a nice thing. But you can't develop your faith just on a miracle. From the point of Jesus, the miracle was a sign to something deeper. It's a sign to him that he has put his hand on your life and he has done something miraculous so that you can take that grace and give it to others. Our success in life isn't necessarily measured by the size of our boat or the quantity of the fish in our nets, but our willingness to obey the direction of God. So it's great to come and listen to a sermon or watch a pod listen to a podcast or watch a preacher. That can help you in your journey, but what are you doing with what you get? That's important. That's important. Your life is meant for purpose. You may not think so, like Peter. And yet God has a place in his economy for you if you are willing to step out and do something you never did before. The next thing it teaches me that empty nets are not the final reality for us. God has planned them, so don't settle for this. And then I read the story slowly. Jesus was pushing Peter's boundaries. And why does God push your boundaries? Because he knows you're capable of doing more tomorrow than you're doing today. In Western cultures, we are used to minimums. Not in Eastern cultures. In Eastern cultures, I know people who go two hours, travel to go to church. In the east of Sri Lanka, there is a church that was established by the Methodist movement. Thank God for the Methodists. They are very authority. Families 
walk through elephant infested regions to get to church on Sunday. Wow. Wow. They walk to church, not just walk. At 5 o'clock in the morning, with the potential and possibility of meeting an elephant along the way. Not the one that's in the parliament at the moment. <laughs> that's a bad flu that refuses to go away. <laughs> He's still raising his hand. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. That's all right. <laughs> and I think, wow! With faith like that, God can turn around the enemy. Peter grew up on the shores of Galilee. And if there is one thing that Peter knew to do well, it was sufficient. But now he is with an empty net. And is intimidated by the emptiness. Nothing. I told Pastor Alan Davis I didn't steal his next Sunday's message. My lines are nothing. So you might be sitting here this morning and you might think you got nothing. You are in a good place. That's not a bad place. Because if you are so full of yourself, God can't use you. You think he can, but he won't. We have to come to a place of emptiness. Paul at the end of his life says, I am poured out for the last part. Wow. What a place to be. Others say, you know, I'll have to serve God, but I don't have the time. You just don't know how to manage time. Or you're taking your time and using it for things that are counterproductive to your destiny and purpose. That's all. And I have seen in 45 years that often the most gifted people are the least used by God. Not because God is uh, having a prejudice, but because they are not available. If we think we can serve God five minutes here, ten minutes there, you're in for another shake. Peter is asked to go to a place that is deeply challenging over his head. A place where he's not in control. Now, now let's be real this morning. We want to be in control. But as long as you are in control, God is. It's painful. We are wired in a way that when life is out of control, we feel insecure. My wife always tells me, you are always in sovereignty. You are in sovereignty. Yeah, because I believe in the sovereignty of God. I've got a bachelor's degree in biblical studies. So I have a little more knowledge of God's sovereignty than others. That's some. Because I have seen God's sovereignty operate from Genesis to Revelation. As long as you let God take it. And get a word from him. A remodel. And it works. Not just in my life, in yours. And the only way to navigate your struggle is to get the Rima word direct from him. Because he is God, he can speak to you. Podcasts are good to develop your faith. But when you are in an empty net, come to God and say, I surrender. That's what it is. And then God takes up your net and he fills it. So you might be sitting here and you've got an empty life. 
You're chasing this dream, that dream, every dream under the sun, and still like Solomon said, nothing. Vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. You never fulfill. You never fulfill. Because you haven't allowed God to unlock the key to your life so that he can take charge. Peter had the sense to say, Master, we have toiled all night, all night, but all, nothing but at your word. I will let the net down. Surrender is personal. Jesus wanted to direct Peter's actions to the very place where the lack seemed intimidating. Because Jesus knew something about Peter that the others didn't, and even he didn't. When I look at Saul of Tarsus, he was responsible for the murder of the first martyr in the New Testament church. But Saul was zealous in what he did for God. And God said, I can put my hand on this guy and drop him to the ground, humiliate him so that all his pride can come out and then I can use him. He knocked him off his horse. Now let me tell you something. If you have pride in your heart, God will knock you off your horse. And you'll end up in the dirt. And that's a good place to be because then you come up. The biggest sin in the Bible is you know pride. And pride is deceptive. We all have it. And it knocks us off our horse. And it brings us to our senses. And that's not a bad thing because Saul said, What do you want me to do? I said, And I think of Peter. Peter would betray Jesus intentionally. I don't know the man. And yet, Jesus so passed away. Failure doesn't have to be final in your life. The scripture says we have all sinned, all, 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 every one of you who think yourself righteous, you have sinned and fallen short of the grace of God. So, here's another truth. Don't judge somebody else harshly. <coughs> Look back at your life. Ask God to do the, the reset button. Look back and see where you were but for the grace of God. When you have an appreciation of God's grace in your life as I do in mine, then we can accept the limitations of others more gracefully and be less judgmental on them. God was going to use Peter to turn around thousands to the faith. But the first turn had to start with him. One of surrender. You know, negativity stops progress. And it stifles creativity. If there is one thing God can't work with is negativity. Ten leaders, ten leaders, rob one point plus million people of their destiny. Do the math. It's frightening. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The life and death, the power of the tongue. Having faith alone isn't enough. We've got to invest that faith somewhere. Some people have faith in faith. We have to have faith in God. So Jesus looks at Peter, they haul up the net, and there's a multitude of fish. And it's interesting because that's not what Jesus is looking at. He's looking at Peter and telling Peter, fear not, from now on you will catch me. First servant, 
3,000 per cent. Now we preach 3,007 and then man gets saved. Sir. <laughs> Jesus used the miracle to work in Peter's heart at a deeper level. That's the place God wants us. And our constant prayer will be this God work in my heart. Peter would become the second greatest apostle in the New Testament church next to Paul. For one reason, Peter's ability to be quick to respond when Jesus asked. I remember the story in the, in the gospel when Jesus asked Peter, whom do men say I am? Oh, some say you are this, some say you are, you know, that, some say you are Elijah. And then he looks at Peter and says, Who do you say? It all comes down to you. And he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Christ. And he says, Peter. You think you got that from Google? You got that from the heaven and earth. Heaven and earth has not believed that you got it from There are some things you can Google, some things you need to get direct from me. Google is a tool. And, and, and I try to get into the feet of this whole scenario and, and something came up. Jesus, when dealing with Peter, didn't associate a failed deed with a failed faith. You might be sitting here and you are allowing a failed deed to direct your life. Don't let it. Failure is part of the process when you engage in your life purpose. So don't tie your self-esteem and self-worth to failure. We all have to. Because failure is a feeling. Failure is a feeling. And when you have a feeling, you have poor self-esteem. You are insecure. You are intimidated by somebody else's success. And I have discovered that the only purpose that can stop me from my destiny or the only person that can stop me from my destiny is me. By magic. We always try to blame somebody else. You know, I didn't get the promotion because they are mean. You're mean like them. That's why you can identify with meanness. God will test your heart. Joseph, he had a great vision. Oh, wow. You know, his vision was leading from the top to the bottom. Because that's the secular style. And often we bring that secular model into the church and get upset. When somebody else whom we think deserve, doesn't deserve a place gets it. But Jesus turned the leadership ladder upside down because the disciples didn't know that in John chapter 10, I believe. He says, you know, they were, he's, he's talking about a cross and they're talking about greatness. Wow. Nothing has changed. He's talking about a cross. And that's it. Who's going to replace it? You, me, me. You know, Peter, James, John, the brothers, sons of Zebedee, uh, you know, they sort of paid the bills when Jesus went out and had kebabs. So they thought, you know, we are in on this. We are in the deal. And then Jesus, the other, got upset. And, and Jesus said, you still don't understand what kingdom philosophy is. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you want to be servant of all. All, all. You know, Turn your name and say, all. I don't like you, but you are part of the all. They say, who can get it? 
The same woman get it. You don't determine whom you serve. One on one, a base. You don't get to select how you serve. I'll do that. Not this. One. And the bucket. This is a starting point. And he modeled that leadership. He modeled it. He took a bucket and he took a towel and he washed the defeat and he called it ministry. That doesn't go well in the Western world because we have a, we all want to be stars. When you have a heart of service, your gift will make you good. When you have a true heart of service, you will serve when you can appreciate our government. Because you want to intentionally add value, not to feel value. That's a portrait in your place of employment. You may start at the bottom, but you can get very quick to the top with the right attitude. And sadly, sadly, sometimes I have seen better attitudes in non-Christians than I have seen in Christians. Peter had to realize I am who I am by the grace of God. When you learn to embrace grace, you can be graceful to others. You know, in Ma Matthew, Jesus said, by the same token you judge others, you are going to be judged. That is awesomely frightening. I don't know if you do that. By the same measure, judge somebody else. You're going to be judged. You can't get away from it. That's all right. But when you're graceful to someone who failed, and you stand beside them and say, Look, you know, I don't want to know all the details of your failure, but I'm going to stand beside you. I'm going to help you walk through your failure so that you can move past it and fulfill your destiny and purpose. You have a friend on your side. That's all it takes. All it took for me to be where I am today is a guy who never never abandoned me when everyone has stayed. And he's the only guy I remember. He said, I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you until you move totally past your failure. Because I know God believes in you and I do too. That's the challenge. God's redemptive value and purpose is best reflected in failure. Now Jesus did, you know, accept Peter's shortcomings. But in John 21, he confronts Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter says, I like you, I like you, I like you. That's it. That, that's the margin. That's serving God on a margin. If you want destiny, you want to move beyond the margin. The original words were not love, L-O-V, agape, which is surrender. They are failures. I like you. You know, when I can, I show up. He doesn't want you to show up when you can. You can't fulfill a destiny that way. If you want to fulfill a deeper purpose, you want to get into the deep. And you got to stand out and do things you can do. And then Peter says, Master, you know what that 
And tradition says that those words of Jesus impacted Peter's life in such a way that when he had to be crucified, he has to be crucified upside down so that he doesn't have to die like his master. Here's the key. Behind every act of forgiveness is a wound of betrayal. Peter betrayed. I don't know. And yet, Jesus forgave so that the wound can heal in Peter's life. And so you might be sitting here this morning and you've been betrayed. Sometimes you've done the wrong thing and that has caused people to walk away from you. You can't blame them, you gotta blame yourself, where it takes two to fight. But maybe you've been in something and, and someone has betrayed you. You've got to choose forgiveness. Because if you don't, it's a prison you will be in for your life. And you know what? Wherever you go, you will take that spirit. A wounded spirit who can bear. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. So the wound can bear. And after Peter was forgiven, he felt accepted and clean. And he went in the power of that forgiveness to reach in the book of Acts. 3,000 people got saved. Jesus on this day in the book of Luke story, he said, this is who you are, this is who you will become. I don't think he ever understood the expanse of the destiny that will unfold before his eyes. One day at a time. He said, Peter, Simon, you shall not go to the because Simon, but Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. Wow. Wow. He's a guy who wouldn't make it on a team today. Do a profile. Profile of Peter, Google, you get the answer. He wouldn't be a guy who would want to sit, it, sit with a table. With a loud mouth, shooting in mouth off, putting in mouth, you know, the fisherman was. And yet, he became the second greatest leader in the New Testament church. And here is the principle for some of you who are in ministry. Look at people the way Jesus himself changes the picture. My job in my position is to look for potential. I don't look for problems because if I look for problems, I will to take gold data plus and the dogs won't fix them up. But I look at people and I think there's potential there. Along with the potential there are some issues we all have then we think we don't but we do. Somebody, somebody, great leader, he said, Pastor David or somebody else has issues. I said, issues, I got an umbrella. <laughs> but you know, I'm conscious. And I know God has accepted me and confirmed me and anointed me in spite of it. And what he said to the other guy came back to me on an email, which is still on my computer, which I will show the guy when the time is right. But you have to walk past it. I stood by him and supported him when everyone, everyone else did. But he betrayed me. But I don't make a decision. I want to get on with my life. And God has a sense of humor. 
It's a choice to stay hurt or to let the hurt go and say, I'm going to walk past this. Because I don't want somebody else to write my destiny. And you know what? When you carry some offense, you are letting somebody else write your life script. When I die, I want my tombstone. It's all there in that little note I kept from Andrew Beatings once a while. Uh, I died with my boots on. <laughs> I want to finish well. And God wants you to finish well. So keep short accounts with God and short accounts with people. Because Jesus didn't repeat that. And God has a purpose. And forgiveness releases really the purpose. If you're struggling with loving yourself, understand God. And walk in that love. Peter said, I am a sinful man. God says, that's all right. I know. You don't give me any information. I want to bring a turnaround in your life. Not only just in your life, but in the lives of others. And the only way I can do that is to yourself. And ask the worship team to come up as we go into the communion. You know, God has ministered to you by.